Okay, let me start with the, <coughs> the, the, the talk on gravitational waves. So I'm going to talk more of how to extract the gravitational wave signals from the detector noise. So you may have heard earlier talks by other people about gravitational waves and how hard they are to detect, how, how they are to detect, because they are extremely weak, actually. And so because of the weakness, they have not been detected uh, for a very long time, like a, something like a century since they were predicted. Einstein predicted them in 1916, while they were detected, the announcement of the first detection was announced on 2016. So it took about a century, in fact, to build detectors or to have sensitive enough detectors for detecting them. But here, what I'm going to talk about is not so much about the detection problem or the detectors and so on, but I'm going to talk about the more uh, statistical techniques or the mathematical techniques which are uh, necessary, <clears throat> what you must apply in order to extract the signal from the noise. So this talk is going to be more on statistics and the mathematics of it, how one goes about it. And we were, I mean, uh, my particular group in Ayuka, in fact, was uh, a very strong uh, <coughs> contributor in this particular part of the aspect of the experiment. So let us start with the problem. So the, what is the need for gravitational wave data analysis? So first thing is the Einstein's theory. Einstein's theory predicts gravitational waves. And in Einstein's theory, what is gravitation? Gravitation is the manifestation of the curvature of space-time. <clears throat> like you know, in Newton's theory, there's the inverse square law. <clears throat> so there's the inverse square law where two masses attract uh, and the force is proportional to the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance. In Einstein's theory, there is no such thing as a force. Gravitation is, in fact, not a force, but it is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. And but I will not so much go into that because here we are more inter interested in the extraction of the signals. So gravitational waves are then waves in the curvature of space-time. So they are waves in the curvature of space-time, just like the curvature itself is the field. So, but Einstein's theory is a metric theory of gravity. That means there's a metric which tells you how the space-time is curved and gravitational waves are measured. So I will write GW for gravitational waves uh, measured by the dimensional metric perturbation H. So this is simply a perturbation to the metric. But H is awfully small because gravitational waves are weak. <clears throat> this is so it's a dimensionless number. H is simply a dimensionless number and H is something like of, of the order of 10 to the minus 23. Now, how do you uh, understand a dimensionless number? If you take, so you understand this by looking at the effect of these waves on particles, on test particles. Just like, just as when you want to say about electromagnetic waves, when you say you detect an electromagnetic wave, you talk about charges being affected by electromagnetic wave, how the charges are moved. Here, the test particles are just any particles, masses. So if you take two masses, which are at a distance L apart, then the amount they move, if, the, if there's a metric perturbation or a gravitational wave with H of 10 to the minus 23, it will be 10 to the minus 23 minus L into L. That means delta L is 10 to the 23 of L, which is extremely small. So, so for example, if you take L to be something like a meter, you will have to measure something like 10 to the minus 23 meters in order to detect the wave. So this is what we mean here. But we have still succeeded in doing this by making a lot of tricks. You make your interferometer not one meter, but kilometers in size. So if you make it kilometers in size, this number, the lengths which you have to measure comes down. And then in that case, you make your beam also the laser beam, which is inside the detector, mounts several times, something like 100 times. So you get an effective length, which is much, much larger, order, off the order of 1,000 kilometers. So instead of one meter, you have gone to 1,000 kilometers. So that's a factor of 10 to the 5. So what you measure there are distances of something like 10 to the minus 18 meters. And that is, in fact, possible by today's technology. So why is H small? That is the point. H is small because 
gravity is a weak force it's the weakest force that we know we have we know there are something like four forces one of them is the electromagnetic magnetic which you know so well there is another force which is the strong force which keeps keeps the nucleus together all the protons which are say positive charges these positive charges are repelled by each other but they are all kept together in the nucleus so that force is called the strong force there is also something called the weak force where if you have a nucleon which gets out of the nucleus it decays and that's called a beta decay so what you have is there are four forces and gravity is the weakest of these forces and uh, so that is the reason why this uh, effect is so small and it can be measured in terms of this metric which is called which we write as h h i k or h v u nu is in fact the metric actually the curvature is in fact some second derivative of the metric and the metric can be looked upon as a potential just as you look about you have a potential in electromagnetic uh, theory you have the potential phi and a phi is the electrostatic potential a is the vector potential and you can write the electromagnetic fields in terms of phi and a similarly if you give h mu nu here or g mu nu the metric tensor then we can write down the curvature the riemann tensor in terms of this curvature uh, in terms of this metric so this is what it is here but because h is small so but that is not what i am going to talk about because h is so small the detector noise overwhelms the gravitational wave signal there is lot of noise going about the detector there is a seismic noise there is thermal noise there is photon shot noise noise which comes from the laser all this noise which is there and the signal is in fact deeply buried inside the noise so signal is buried inside this noise in fact the signal is hidden inside this noise and one must extract the signal from the noise that is in fact the problem <clears throat> i'll show you some pictures how things look like so here is the <clears throat> the noise in the ligo detectors it is basically characterized by what is called the <clears throat> power spectral density which is written as sh of f okay that is s of f is in fact the <clears throat> in the fourier domain you write down the noise and you take what is called the power spectral density i'll be defining this thing i've just written down these things here now but as i go along in my lecture in my talk i will define this precisely what one means how one defines this sh of f h is there means it's the signal channel which is h of t okay so that's why the h is there so what is plotted here is in fact the square root of this power spectral density and it is basically the h that is the noise in the detector can be also described in terms of the how much h is there what is the metric perturbation the same metric perturbation which measures the signal also can be used for the noise and that's what is being used here so if you think of this uh, noise here this noise as you can see on the left hand side is square root of h of f is on the vertical axis on the bottom axis that's the horizontal axis is f in logarithmic units so this is a log log plot so what it shows you that i don't know if you can see that sh of f the square root of sh of f gets down to something like 10 to the minus 22 10 to the minus 23 the initial ligo was at the level of if you see here is the red curve is the initial ligo so that curve was at something at the level of 10 to the minus 22 or little below that but the current curve which is the advanced ligo is much lower of course we haven't got up to that there but we are some something like three quarters of the way to it in the current times in 2020 so we are quite close there so the h that is there the noise also measured in terms of h h is of the order of 10 to the minus 23 or something at the lowest spot but if you see at other places the noise is more because it the curve climbs up as you go lower in frequency as you go higher in frequency also up to a kilohertz or so the curve again climbs up so the bandwidth as it is here is of the order of a kilohertz and it ranges at the moment something like from 20 hertz to something like a few kilohertz or one or two kilohertz so this is a, this is the basic noise but i'll be defining sh of f as i 
go along so you know exactly what i am talking about now to come down to the thing here this is the signal so typical so what i am going to talk uh, here is i am going to restrict myself to a particular kind of signal which is the black hole binary signal because those are the signals which have been detected so far so i thought i will talk about these kind of signals and of course there are other kind of signals also but this particular signal has been detected so many of black hole binaries have been detected there is a neutron star binary which has been detected so i thought i will confine myself in this talk to particularly to how one goes about searching for the signal in the detector data so the signal now is on the left side see here you see the signal you have the the signal looks like this h in the thing looks like this that h first it's a sinusoidal kind of signal the frequency and the amplitude keep on increasing until there is a merger so here the two black holes are spiraling around each other as they spiral around each other they give you this kind of a signal when they merge that is the highest the peak of the signal and once the black hole is formed the black hole also oscillates before it settles down into a spinning black hole or a stationary state so then you don't get any signal and the signal dies out you don't see anything h is zero after that so this is the kind of signal now this signal if it is in the detector noise of course uh, amplitude has been reduced so the noise is here this data this is the whole detector noise is a what is plotted here is a data segment so x of t if i call the data then this x of t is plotted as a function of t as time and you take a particular data segment zero to some capital t and then plot the noise as a function of time it's a so noise in fact is a random variable and you can see that it's like this and if you have a signal typically if a signal is there you can't see anything in it so how do you then know that there is a signal so this is exactly the problem how do you extract the signal from the noise and in this case we know the waveform very well we can calculate the waveform of the signal because black holes and other are clean systems and although general relativity is a very difficult theory it has been possible to calculate the signal either doing approximations post newtonian approximation and so on and then or numerically you use numerical computations or perturbation theory so in this part of the thing you have the post newtonian theory then in the middle you have to do numerical relativity at the end you have the perturbation theory black hole perturbation theory how how the waveform looks like so we know the signal very well and once we know the signal quite well we can use a technique called match filtering so i will be coming to the, all these things so signal so right now in for this slide the signal has a amplitude something like h is less than 10 to the minus 23 typically what the amplitude of the noise is more 10 to the minus 23 maybe 10 times more or 20 times more and the signal is tiny sitting inside it the signal is buried in the noise and our task is to extract the signal from the noise so what you have to say say if a signal is present or absent and further estimate its parameters for so estimation of parameters comes later first you have to answer the yes and no question that is whether there is a signal in the noise in the data or there is no signal in the data so we'll address that question here in this talk so <clears throat> what you need to do is the data needs to be processed and this processing is called filtering so it's a basically a problem in algebra if you like you rearrange the data in such a way that you can interpret the data for saying whether there is a signal or there is no signal <clears throat> when the signal is known as we know in the case of a binary black holes or neutron stars or it or if it belongs to a family of waveforms the method used is matched filtering so here of course we don't have a single signal because we don't know what the masses of the black holes are so different pairs of masses will give out different kind of signals so if you have masses which are much bigger the signal the masses will coalesce much quicker and you will have a very short signal but if there are something like neutron stars which are of the which are like 1.4 times the mass of the sun then these are much smaller masses and they can take something like several seconds in fact minutes to in fact to coalesce the one we saw one of the 
one which has been studied very well, the neutron star coalescence in the second run, was uh, that particular say, uh, signal lasted for 100 seconds. And we saw something like 3,000 cycles <coughs> of that signal. So that was pulled out by match filtering. And this was something which was done, which was developed also in Ayuka a lot, this particular kind of technique. And I'll come to that at the end of my talk. <coughs> now, the situation, as I said, applies to black holes and neutron star coherences. They are like point masses. They go around each other. They emit gravitational waves. As they emit gravitational waves, <coughs> they emit energy. And because the whole system loses energy, they come closer together and finally coalesce. So this will be the content of my talk. So a simple example is here. Now, this is not a binary signal. I have just inserted. This is just a, a simulation, if you like. A signal S of t, okay, which is one amplitude, which is a constant A, time is cosine 2 pi F naught t. And this is buried in the noise N of t. So the, what is this noise? This is what is called white noise. I'll define. I'll be defining what is meant by white noise and so on. But at, for the moment, you can just think of it as noise. Noise at it's a random variable. At each t, the n is a random variable. So it's a whole lot of random variables which are being plotted here in sequence. So that is n of t. Now this signal is extremely small. This amplitude is small. It is so small that it's much less than the amplitude of the noise. But it is buried inside the noise, and you can't see anything at all in this particular figure. But now, what you do is you apply the Fourier transform. So here is the Fourier transform operation. So x of f is minus infinity to plus infinity x of t e to the minus 2 pi f t dt. This is called the Fourier transform. You apply the Fourier transform at each f. You apply to this thing. And what you get, you plot the modulus of xf. So what is plotted in the right-hand side is the modulus of the Fourier transform versus f. So if you plot this thing, what you see is two peaks here. See, this is the noise, but you see peaks here. And these peaks are exactly at 256 hertz and minus 256 hertz. That is because this is a cos 2 pi f t, f not t. So which can be split into 2 pi, 2 pi e to the i, 2 pi i, f not t plus e to the 2 pi minus 2 pi f naught t divided by 2. So that's why you get the peaks. And the heights of the peaks would be something like t by 2, capital T by 2, and so on. So here are the peaks. And you essentially got the signal out of the noise. But that is not all. You have to say uh, that this is actually the signal. How do you know this is a signal? How do you know that this noise has not masqueraded as a signal? So these are the kind of questions that one needs to address and answer. So these are the kind of things I'll be talking about. So answer to this thing is, in this particular problem here, this is in fact, you can't be 100% sure. One can never be 100% sure in a statistical detection. When you are making a detection in noise of anything, in fact, in real world, there is always noise. So any detection you make is always statistical. So you can never be 100% sure that it is that you have actually detected it. Of course, now I can't see you. So when I'm giving a lecture in a class, for example, or a class of students, or there's a lecture hall of audience, and then I say that uh, there is somebody sitting there. I'm not 100% sure that, that somebody is sitting there. I, I don't know. It may be a hologram for all you know. So of course, I may be very, very sure that the probability of detection may be 0 0.9999999 and so on, but it is never one. That's the point. The point is the probability, can, you can never say with unique probability or one probability that the that's a, that you have made the detection with probability one. There is always something small, one something that is left out. So one can never be 100% sure. So what best can we do? So the what best we can do is we can de define things like detection and false alarm probability. And there's a whole kind of uh, analysis or there's a whole kind of uh, literature which tells you how this has to be done in statistics. So in order to do this, several things have to be done. We have to understand the noise. So one must understand the detector noise, its statistics, its color. I'll come to all what it means, all, all these things. 
And then you have to do something what is called hypothesis testing, that is binary and composite. If there are, if there's only two things, that is there's a specific signal which is given to you, and you have to only say that whether that specific signal is there in the noise or not, then it's a yes no question. And such a thing is called a binary hypothesis. So we'll deal first with that because it's much easier. And then we go to the composite hypothesis. And that's the really our situation where we have a family of signals. And the signal could be any one of those family or the signal may not be there. So you have a composite hypothesis and there is a, so H naught as we call, is that there is no signal. H1, there is a, but there is a signal, but it belongs to that, or that particular family. So it, it's, a, it's one signal in that particular family. So it's one among the family. And the only thing you can do is that, you, since you can't say that the probability is one, you can allow, you can define things called false alarm and detection probabilities or false dispersal probability. So all these things I'll defining. And there is the so-called, so what is, uh, what is appropriate in our case is what is called the Neyman Pearson criterion. And the Neyman Pearson lemma tells you how to actually do go about it, the likelihood ratio and things like that. And then I'll come to match filtering and then composite hypothesis and maximum likelihood detection. So this is the way, this is the basically the plan of the talk. So now I come to the main part of the talk. <clears throat> so now, now noise properties. So first you have to study the noise in order to say whether it is a signal or not, you have to understand the noise. Unless you understand the noise, you can't say what is noise, what is the signal. So consider a data segment zero to T. So you have a time series data, okay? So from zero to T, you mark out a segment, okay? And now you concentrate, focus on this segment. So here, so then the noise is a stochastic process. It's called N of T. So you can think, you know, that there's a random variable. You, you can give probabilities, assign probabilities to a random variable. N of T is a stochastic process. What that means is that it's a function, which is random. That means that each T, it's a random variable. And these random variables can be correlated. So if you select certain time samples of this n of t, say finite number, then this finite number forms a random vector, and you have a multi-dimensional, multivariate, uh, 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 multivariate distribution, uh, statistical distribution, which is uh, defined by some probability distribution p of n1 of t, n2, n3, n3, so on. So then the noise is a stochastic process. We usually sample the data uniformly, unless in certain other cases. I mean, but in case of uh, the binary, for example, we do it usually uniformly. And the samples are at tk equal to k times delta, where delta is a fixed uh, time interval, which is t divided by the number of samples. So t is the total length of the data train divided by n. So just uh, to give you a number of, uh, give an idea of the numbers, the time can be something like if you take a signal here, like 100 seconds or something like that, or a few minutes, then your T can be something like 10 minutes or 8 minutes, or it could be few hundred seconds, your signals are going to be shorter. So T is something like that. Then you may sample, the sampling is done by what is the frequency of the signal that you're going to attain. So suppose you allow the signal to, you want to look for signals up to say a kilohertz, then you sample at two kilohertz. So suppose you sample at two kilohertz and you have something like 100 seconds of data or 500 seconds of data, then N is of the order of a million. So N is a quite a large number, okay? Something like a million or so. So there are million samples. So you have a million dimensional space, if you like, of N1, N2, N3, N going up to million. And this is, in fact, a random vector. You can write it as a random vector. So the noise samples of N, N, TK equal to NK, we may write this in a bold face letter N as a column vector with components NK. Now, we assume that uh, many things you put restrictions on the noise, and these are what are observed, basically. If you are looking for signals of few minutes or something like that, 
the noise is essentially stationary so what is what does it mean by stationary that the mean of the noise doesn't change so you take the ensemble average of the noise at any time t that is constant so n of <clears throat> so what is an ensemble average so this average is if you take several det identical detectors and you look at the noise in each of those detectors at time t and take the average that is called the ensemble average so what so you take the n of t say in a horizontal line and draw the detectors say vertically okay i 1 2 3 4 going up to whatever and sum over at a particular time over those samples of noise then take the average that is the ensemble average now what this particular thing says here is that n of t the average of n at time t is the same as the average at n of t plus tau where tau is some other time lag or time uh, another extra time which is there time which is time is later so t plus tau so the mean does not change and this is true for all tau okay, so this symbol all for all is here for all tau the mean is the same and the variance is also same so this is or this is the second moment so in this case we will take the mean to be zero normally like here so in that case this is becomes the covariance so n of t times n of t prime you take the ensemble average of this product then this product is also remains the same <coughs> so this is simply the second moment okay so the first two moments so if you put this restrictions on the first two moments this is called wide sense stationary so you only require this kind of restriction so this is much more uh, less this is a weaker restriction than what is stationary stationary means all moments should be stationary so or you can say that the whole distribution function is stationary okay so angular brackets uh, they, uh, they denote ensemble average and if you subtract the dc component of the noise we can write nt equal to 0 you can always put uh, subtract the dc component so you get nt equal to 0 the ensemble average and then n of t of t can be written as k of t minus t prime because this is stationarity you can always write it out in this form that it just depends on the absolute value or t minus t prime that is the it does not depend so the variance or the what you call the covariance does not depend on individual t or something it depends it only depends on the difference in the time so it is k of t minus t prime and this k tau if you write now this tau is not the same as this tau tau is t minus t prime is called the autocorrelation of the noise and if you calculate its Fourier transform, that is S of F. So this was the thing which was appearing in the previous uh, curves which I showed you for the LIGO noise curves. And then now if you do the, just re transform this equation, I have not done the algebra. I have not showed you the algebra. I have done the algebra, but not shown you the algebra. Then N of F times N star of F prime is S of F times delta F prime, which is the Dirac delta function. So this is the property of what is called the white st sense stationary noise or WSS noise. And this S of F is called the power spectral density of the noise. So SF is called the PSD or the power spectral density of the noise. And what is plotted here, so it has, as you see, it's a quadratic in N or in or in the or in H, if you like, or in the data stream. So if you take its square root, it is like so you come back to the amplitude. So one normally takes its square root and going back, you can see that this is the this is what is plotted here. So it is the square root of SH of F versus F. And this goes to the levels of 10 to the minus 23 or 10 to the minus 20 or below 10 to the minus 23. So the current det detectors which are there have S, S of the square root of S of F uh, <coughs> equal to something like 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 23. If S of F is a constant, then that noise is called white. Okay, that's a very, that's idealization. It normally never happens because your detector is always has a finite range or a finite bandwidth. So S of F being white noise is, is simply an idealization. And uh, you can consider it to be white in a certain bandwidth. For example, if you take a certain bandwidth of interest, 
maybe a few hundred hertz or something like that. And if your SF is uh, roughly constant, you can consider the noise to be white. An example of white noise is uh, many times in audio systems, for example, if you have no music or not something, any signal coming in it, you get a hiss, okay? That is white noise. So if the noise is not white, then it's colored. So the noise of LIGO detectors is colored and the plot here I showed you was in fact showed you, showed you exactly that. So now I come to the match filter. So now what is the match filter? We assume additive noise. So that's another thing which you're assuming here. So first of all, we have assumed what? WSS noise, that the white stationary, we can always make the uh, average of NT equal to zero, but that's not an uh, assumption that you can always do that without any problem. It is also additive. So we assume additive T because that's the reason is that H of T is very small. Because H of T is extremely small, what happens is that basically the signal adds to the noise. So such a thing is called additive noise. If your signal was stronger than harmonics or things like that, nonlinear effects can come in and then your noise would not be additive and things would be uh, more complicated. But here, because of the weakness of the signal, this is in fact an advantage. In WSS noise, the match filter in the Fourier space is given by this quite, quite a quantity. You define a Q of F equal to H of F, so H of T is your signal. So say from the black hole binary or particular mass. So H of F divided by SH of F. So if you divide the signal by this, and then you apply this filter to the data. So your data is X of T. You apply this filter Q star of F, H X of F DF minus infinity to plus infinity. This is a real number because uh, Q of T, all these things are real quantities actually. X of F and so on, because this is H of F. H of, it is H of F has come from H of T, which is real. SH of F is also, SH of minus F is plus of F and so on. So Q of T is in fact real, if you take the inverse for your transform. So these are real functions. And if you do these things, C is a real random variable. So now consider, so you can calculate this quantity, which is called the correlation or which is called the statistic. This is called a statistic. And this is what you will compare later on with the threshold. So in the earlier case of the Fourier transform, when you took the modulus, that was the statistic. Here the statistic is this, where Q of F will be your match filter. Now what I'll show is that if you take the match filter, then this is the best that you can do. C will get you the highest signal to noise ratio or on an average, C will be the largest or the biggest. And that is what you want. You want the peak as large as possible. So I define the signal to noise ratio like this. Take the mean of the C. So C is a random variable. Why is it a random variable? Because X is a random variable. X is H of T plus N of T. N of T is a random variable, which makes X of T a random variable. X of F is just a linear, uh, linear, uh, what, uh, uh, linear process on X of T, or just X of T is expressed to the Fourier basis, if you like. So this is a random variable. So is C a random variable. So you take the mean, which is the mu of C. So, and its standard deviation is given by this particular formula, which you would know, C, C square, ensemble average of C square minus the mean square, square root of that is called the standard deviation. If you divide mu C by sigma C, you get what is called the signal to noise ratio. <clears throat> so this is the signal divided by the noise. Noise is given by this. This is the signal, so one you divide by the other, and so you get what is called the signal to noise ratio. <clears throat> so if you plug in any function Q, not necessarily the patch filter, you will get a signal to noise ratio, which will depend on Q. So it depends on a function. So what is this? So actually, mathematically, this is called a, <clears throat> a functional. It is a functional. It maps functions to real numbers. It is mapping the function Q to a real number rho. So that's why this is called a functional. So a rho is a functional. It maps a function space, something called a 
L2, for example, <coughs> space of data trains or space of functions to real numbers. And those real numbers are C or near uh, uh, numbers are rho. So now what I show is that the match filter is optimal. So if you take mu C equal to this Q, this C, remember this Q is not at the moment the match filter. Then you take its average value and so on. Uh, because the average value of NT has been assumed to be zero, N of F also the average value of N of F is zero, and it uh, turns out to be just this quantity. So mu C is this, then sigma C is this. It is a, if you calculate this kind of things, you get this equal to this kind of thing. So the rho Q can be written as this particular quantity over here. And now you can use the cauchy schwarz inequality, and using that one can show that that Rho Q is less than this. So what is the cauchy schwarz inequality? You write, if you have a scalar product between two vectors, then mod of X dot Y is less than mod of X times mod of Y. So you can use that kind of a cauchy schwarz inequality to show that this is in fact less than this. And one, and one finds that if you plug in Q of F equal to HF or SH of F, you get exactly this. Because if you put Q star, it will be H star of F, and then you divide by SH of F, you get this exactly. So <laughs> what you have shown is that the equality is attained if Q is chosen to be the match filter, or the match filter ma maximizes the SNR among all linear filters. That's why we use the match filter in our analysis. So all these things which we have done, you know, all this the first detection that was done by the uh, LIGO detectors was done with match filters. So you had a templates and so on, <clears throat> bank of filters, and those bank of filters ran through a whole parameter space, and you one used match filters in order to, in fact, uh, extract that signal and show that there was a detection. So it gives the best things. It gives the highest peak. But then, so here is a picture of that. So here is the signal. This is the uh, signal, which is the binary, black hole binary. <clears throat> Then this is uh, this is embedded in the noise. Of course, a much smaller version of it. The amplitude is reduced, so you can't see a thing here. And you apply the match filter as I've shown you earlier, Q of F and so on. If you do that and plot C versus T, now go to the Fourier domain and plot C of tau at each T. So at each T, you do this uh, you do this operation. Put a you plug in a e to the minus two pi i f tau if you like. And uh, in this particular thing here, and what you'll get is a, you can plot the C of tau versus tau. Tau is the time lag, and you get a peak here. So the peak comes at where the time, where the signal has arrived in the detector. So this is a peak, but then you are not through yet. This peak is there, but how do you know this is not because of a noise? We have applied the optimal filter and obtained the best SNR. So so far so good. Okay. So you have done best, whatever you can do. But you can't say anything until you can have to make probabilistic statement. You can't say that it is still a signal. Where do you put the threshold? You can apply a threshold and say that this, in fact, see, peak is significant. But where do you apply the threshold? So all this needs, all this, uh, so all this analysis needs to be done. Is the peak because of signal or noise? What are the probabilities? At what level should we set the threshold? to decide the question whether there is a signal or noise in this in this data. So the next thing is you have to study the statistics of the noise. So the statistics of the noise is, so the simplest thing is a Gaussian noise. So what is a Gaussian? These are examples of Gaussian. So here is a one of the, say, you take one noise sample, say at t equal to, say, t1 or tk or something like that. If the noise is zero mean, then it looks something like this. If you see this, uh, this is the vertical axis, and this is zero. You have a Gaussian, which looks like this. So this is a Gaussian noise, OK? If you have some signal, OK, which is shifted by A, so the mean is over here, then it looks something like this. So the Gaussian is shifted, and it looks something like this. So these are. X is a Gaussian distributed random variable, and this is simply a one-dimensional distribution. But we have several, several of those noise. 
So we have sampled the noise and we have many noise samples. So then the thing is not so the problem is not so simple. We have an n-dimensional distribution. So n is a n-dimensional random vector. It has a multivariate distribution. And if it was the Gaussian noise, then the Gaussian noise is given by this kind of a quantity. P of n is this. This is just a, a normalization factor which which tells you that the integral of Pn is in fact equal to one. The probability should add up to one. So that's what should do what it should do. But this is a Gaussian with n t, and this is a C inverse n. So this is a matrix here. N t is a uh, row vector and n here is a column vector so you have a scalar here or a or something which is a number which is sitting here so here c is a covariance matrix whose each entry is cik is just the autocorrelation function cik equal to nink this was the k which i had written there uh, which i had written earlier nink so this is exactly that but you have to take the inverse of that and this is what how the distribution looks like so just looking at this here, you have look like, uh, so that's what is called Gaussian noise. But you detect the noise need not be Gaussian. But one sees that when you, when you do all this kind of cleaning of the data and so on, you, your noise tends to become Gaussian. So that's why uh, this Gaussian noise is important. Also, Gaussian noise is in fact a noise in which there is least information. It's a maximum entropy distribution over the real line with the fixed variance. Anyway, so now we come to the hypothesis testing here. So now, as I said, the random vector x, x is a data vector, then it is a random vector. It has a probability distribution. So if the random vector is just noise, so that is the signal absent case, that particular hypothesis is called H0, x is n, then the PDF is just P naught X. And the P naught X would be just a noise is a random distribution, which is just distributed around zero. So it will be something like this, which would be some, which is this kind of a distribution. But if there is a signal here, H, which is here, then it is shifted because we are taken just a, what is called a additive noise. The P one X here is just P naught of x minus h. So x is just n plus h. So it is shifted just like in the one dimensional case. So that is h1. And now we have to decide between the two hypotheses, h0 or h1. So we have to decide between p0, x, and p1x. So the test is what? So you have to decide. So how do you decide this? So this is called the Neyman Pearson criteria. Partition the space of data trains Rn into R plus R complement. X in R, we say that the, the that the signal is present or H1 is true. Otherwise, X is an RC or the R complement and signal is absent. And we define two particular, two kinds of probabilities. One is called a false alarm, which is the integral of P naught X over R, which tells you that, that this is the probability that the noise masquerades as a signal in the thing. Otherwise, uh, so th that's the kind of thing which you want to keep extremely low. Okay, so PF is you have to make it extremely small so that you don't mistake noise for the signal. And the other thing is the detection probability, which you want high, something like ninety percent or ninety-five percent, where you integrate P one X over the whole data space of data trains. So you integrate over R <coughs> this particular thing. So this is PD. So the Neyman Pearson criterion tells you maximize PD for a fixed P alpha or PF. That means PF equal to alpha, you fix PF equal to alpha, then you maximize PD for that. So that's the best way that you can do this thing. And that's how this, uh, this is how one can pose the problem for black hole binaries. This is the best thing you can do. Uh, there are other criteria also like cost and all that here. But in this case, there is no meaningful way in which we can assign costs and things like that. So the Neyman Pearson criterion is the best criterion for uh, this kind of detection. Black hole binaries, neutron star binaries, or gravitational waves. So now the Neyman Pearson lemma tells you how to find R. So the problem here is now what is R? Okay, how will you fix R? 
So this brings us to the problem of thresholds and so on. So the Neyman Priyasan criterion, I'll go now more quicker through this because I think uh, <clears throat> my time seems to be getting over for the lecture. We have 15 minutes or so, at least for one hour talk. How to find R? <laughs> so the prescription is given by the Neyman Priyasan lemma. Define the likelihood ratio. So it's, a, it's a ratio of P1x or P0x. The regions which maximize PD are of the form R lambda naught, lambda x greater than lambda naught. So lambda x is a function, okay, <laughs> on this thing. And lambda naught is a number. So what it tells you is that the PD is maximized for regions of this form, lambda x greater than or equal to lambda naught. So in case of the one dimensional case, so just to do this for one dimension, so just to understand, let us do it for a one dimensional case. So first thing is you have to fix lambda naught. So you must fix the lambda naught high enough that your PF is small. So what you do is, so the, this is P naught X. So you must integrate P naught X. So here it is the P naught X. You integrate so that PF alpha is small. So you, fix lambda naught somewhere here, so that you're at the tail of this Gaussian, as far away as possible. Normally something like 10 to the minus six or something like that, one, of, one over a million or something like that. And that will tell you what is lambda naught. So your chance of making a mistake is one in a million. In the, so the noise will come out, go up beyond lambda naught is one in a million. And your signal, if you if a is large enough here, then your signal the, the distribution p one x is here e to the minus lambda minus a u squared over it just shifted over here. It's a Gaussian here, and if you integrate from lambda naught to infinity, you'll get a sizable number if your a is large. So suppose you fix your detection probability at 0.95, then that gives you what a you must have, and that gives you a critical. So if A is greater than A critical, you say you have detected a signal with detect detection probability 95% with a false probability of 10 to the minus 6. So that's how you have done. <clears throat> so what I had said, so this one dimensional case is somewhat too simplified. In case of uh, if when there are more than one random variables, the problem is uh, there are there's more room for to find R. So PD has to be maximized. And the Neyman Pearson demo tells you how to maximize this. I mean, that tells you that if you choose the, your regions like this, then your PD is automatically maximized. The match filter is optimal in the Neyman Pearson cell sense in Gaussian noise. So if your noise was Gaussian, then PD is maximized for a fixed PF. And that is shown by this. Given a scalar product, you define a scalar product on the space of data trains x dot y equal to mu i k x i y k, where mu i k is c inverse of that, exactly the thing which enters into the Gaussian noise. So c is the covariance matrix. Then log lambda, as you see, is if you take this and if you do it for the Gaussian noise, so Gaussian noise, as I told you, was this. Here, this is the Gaussian noise, p n, OK? So if you take p naught to be that, then P1x, log of P1x minus log of P0x would be just this, x dot h minus half h dot h. But h is just a signal, which is the constant. x is your random variable, x dot h. So log lambda has to be greater than some log lambda naught. And these are all monotonic functions. <clears throat> so instead of using lambda, one can use, in fact, x dot h as your variable, as your statistic. So we can replace log lambda by surrogate rho equal to x dot h, but which is what? It is exactly the match filter because of monotonicity. Because rho is now x dot h, it is mu i k x i h k, which is now if I write mu i k h k as q i, then this is just q i x i. And q i is mu i k h k. And in the Fourier space, this just goes to HF or SHF. So there you are. So in the if you have Gaussian noise, the batch filter also is optimal in the Neyman Pearson sense. That means the detection probability is maximized 
maximize for a fixed false alarm. So that's so that's why the match filter is, in fact, optimal in two ways. It is uh, optimal <coughs> among all linear filters. That's what we showed with the Gauchy-Schwarz inequality. It is op also optimal in the Neyman-Pearson sense. And this was the filter which was used in actually for detecting the signals. Now I come to the composite hypothesis. So all this is true for uh, binary hypothesis. So in this case, what we had assumed was there was a signal H which was known. There's only one signal. So like you know what are the masses of the binary, for example, <clears throat> and orient to the binary and so on. So if you had such a situation, then in that case, you would have used the binary hypothesis where you know exactly the signal. But that's not the situation we are in. We don't know what are the parameters of the signal. And so what you have is a family of signals. So however, we are not in this situation. We do not have one signal waveform. We have, in fact, a family of signals. The signals depend on the parameters, say, lambda alpha. So H is a function of lambda alpha, H as a vector, where alpha is 1, 2, 3, 4, up to M. So there are M parameters. In the MB, in the BBH, BBH means black hole binary case, there are masses, spins. I have not used spins here, but anyway, there could be spins, masses, spins, kinematical parameters like amplitude, time of arrival, phases, etc. So these are all parameters which enter into the signal. And <clears throat> you could have a binary with any kind of masses. So uh, the binary could have masses like the first binary black holes, which are de detected. Those were in masses, something like 29 solar mass, 36 solar mass. Later on, all kinds of black holes were detected with different masses. So you have to search through this, basically the <clears throat> space of, or parameter space of masses. There are spins. There are, you have to spin, you have to search through the amplitude, time of arrival. You don't know the, when the signal is going to come, whether it's going to come today, tomorrow, after one hour, or after one week. We don't know the time of arrival. So this is also a parameter. You don't know the amplitude. You don't know the inclination of the binary and so on. <clears throat> so these are all parameters or phases, gender as phases into the waveform. So we have a composite hypothesis. H0, no signal present. X is N. So we have two kinds of hypothesis. Again, H1 and H0 and H1. So one case is just simple. That is no signal present. No, nothing at all. So none of the family is present. And H1 is one among the family of this is present, H alpha, H of lambda alpha is present, where X is N plus H lambda alpha, where lambda alpha is something fixed. So with the corresponding PDF now denoted by P1X lambda alpha. So now the P1 or the other, <coughs> when there is the, when there is a signal in the noise, there is this one that that P1 is also dependent on lambda alpha. The prescription now is to construct. So what is the so now again our Neyman Pearson criterion comes to your help. The prescription now is to construct a average likelihood ratio. So we don't have just uh, one single lambda alpha by marginalizing or this likelihood ratios. So now likelihood likelihood ratio also depends on lambda alpha. Is P1 x lambda alpha divided by P naught X, integrate this over lambda alpha with some prior, if you like, and that is your average. So that's, I have, I have denoted again by angular brackets. It's not the ensemble average, but something else. <coughs> it is the integral where you average your likelihood ratio over lambda alpha. Then the average, then what does the Neyman Pearson thing say? Then the average detection probability, which is, Again, PD, which is which is there, which is integrated, this is maximized for a given false alarm probability, PF equal to alpha. So we have not lost anything. So we have not lost much, but you have to calculate the average uh, detection probability. But then we have something simpler. If the signal is strong, so here strong means that the standard deviation is uh, that your signal peak the SNR which you get from that row is 
much greater than sigma of the noise. So that the sigma, the noise has some sigma. Sigma is a standard deviation. So if it is a uh, so typical case of uh, uh, signals which you have, your signal to noise ratio for the neutron star was 32. For the first detection, it was like 25, 24, 25. So if your signal is strong, you say we put a threshold at around 10 or something, 8 or 10, <coughs> the row is much greater than 10 sigma. In that case, the likelihood function is peaked. And then that integral simply reduces. It, it looks like a delta function. And the integral can be reduced to a single point. Just evaluating the function lambda at that particular lambda naught. So what you go, what you do is you calculate the maximum of the likelihood ratio. So you have given this lambda x alpha, x lambda alpha. You calculate the maximum over lambda alpha. And that maximum over lambda alpha is lambda max. This is called the maximum likelihood. And this is called maximum likelihood de detection, where you compare your lambda max x now with some lambda naught. And now that lambda naught has, has to be fixed depending on lambda max x. So now you have to do exactly like what you did before, which I went here into this kind of things, for this one dimensional case and so on. <clears throat> so that's the basic way you do this kind of things. So I come to the, just to give an example. So this was the thing we did in 91. In fact, we gave this particular kind of uh, algorithm. Of course, that algorithm has been refined over the years. This was done in 91 and in 94. Now, I think there are more than 25, quarter of a century has gone. So there have been, of course, have been refinements and things on that. But basic procedure remains exactly the same. This, this is what I have to tell you. So consider the simpler case of the spinless black holes. I just run through this, how this works. You have parameters. So I take the simple case of there are no spins on the black holes. They are just Schwarzschild black holes, if you like. Amplitude is A. Time of arrival is Ta. Phi naught. Mass is M1 and M2. So we have just five parameters. Now use the match filter, so which is the surrogate for the likelihood ratio lambda. And what you have to do is, if you have to do maximum likelihood, Maximize over all the parameters. So you have to maximize lambda over all the parameters, but the surrogate is the match filter. So you have to take filters corresponding to the parameters and calculate the statistic at each point. And the maximization has to be done over what? A, TA, phi naught, M1, and M2. So now one thing which we showed that time was that these three things are very easy to do, or one can do very efficiently, not easy to do, but you can do this efficiently. Over A, if you want to do it, amplitude, you simply normalize your templates, or you say normalize the, you normalize the templates S, lambda, alpha, and so that norm of S is one. We have already, as, you, as I told you, we have defined the scalar product. That is defined by this mu i k, which is given by this, where C is the covariance matrix, which you got from the noise. <clears throat> OK, so you have a scalar product. That scalar product defines a norm. And you do you what you do is you put this S equal to 1. So what you have done is basically you have put the standard deviation of the noise equal to 1. So if you have to do this, then you get rho. Amplitude will exactly will be equal to the rho. Rho will be equal to A. and the expected value of the signal to noise ratio will give you the amplitude. The time of arrival is again can be done by doing a FFT. Simply that particular thing over here, which was there, you know, this here you plug in a e to the minus two pi i FT, do a fast Fourier transform, and if you do a fast Fourier transform, you come and get this. Uh, you get TA. You you get the whole C of TA, which is there. And then you look at, you look for the maximum of that. So that is the C of TA. And phi naught is just can be done with just two templates at phi naught equal to zero and phi naught equal to pi by two. We calculate two batch filters, C naught and C pi by two corresponding to the phases phi naught equal to zero, phi naught equal to pi by two, square and add. That simply gives the maximum again over phi naught. So this maximization for these three things can be 
done very quickly. I refer you to, to this old paper, 1991 paper, where this is all done. But for M1, M2, there is no efficient procedure. And one has to, in fact, uh, do a bank of templates. That means you densely cover the parameter space with a bank of templates. So you have to, what one must do is you, cal you define an ambiguity function, which is defined like this, S dot S alpha, S, S of lambda prime alpha. So you take these templates, which are normalized, take the scalar product of these things. Again, by the Schwartz inequality, because the norm is one, H alpha is less than or equal to one because of the Schwartz inequality. And what you do is you, if your signal mismatches, so what you do is you densely cover the parameter space with these templates. So you, you calculate the batch filter at each of these templates. So here, 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 you keep on calculating your uh, batch filters. But then you can't uh, separate the filters too far away because if you separate them too far away, you will lose in the signal to noise ratio because your signal mismatches the template. So generally, you can define a metric and so on, all these things uh, we had done. We can do a differential geometry also on the whole uh, space of data trains and a manifold, signal manifold, <coughs> and things like that. And the mismatch which you, are, you give is something like 0.03, 3%. So you allow your signal to mismatch at most by 0.03. So this is called the minimal match. Epsilon is 0.03 by 3% because then if you, what you mean is that the amplitude, will, you can afford that the amplitude goes down by 3%. That means the volume, you are, you are willing to lose the volume of something like 10%. Okay, That means you cube this 1 minus epsilon cubed, which will be something like 0.9. So you might lose, in fact, you don't lose that much because the average, I mean, it's just at the worst case is 0.03. So here is how the whole template bank looks. This is in some parameters, tau naught, tau three. So don't worry about that. But the templates, if they are there, they span up circles or something like ellipses. And you must put them close enough so that this is a tiling problem. So you tile the parameter space so that you, there are no holes there anywhere in the parameter space and so on. So you need a whole lot of these templates and then you maximize. Once you have done the maximize, my maximizing this thing, then you have to put a threshold and the threshold is decided by the false alarm probability. So the threshold, so how do you decide on the false alarm probability? You decide on something like, you might want a false alarm, something like two in a year or one in a year. So you can afford to make mistakes. So how do you decide on this false alarm? So that depends on the number of events that you expect to detect. So, for example, in the current situation of the LIGO, <coughs> you have something like, you might expect to detect something like 40, 50 events a year, one every week or something like that. So, in that case, you might afford two false alarms a year or one in six months. So, then you have to calculate the number of random variables you'll get in one year. Now, there's something like a million templates here and so on. So in the general case, when you're searching for the masses, the masses range from generally from one solar mass to 100 solar masses or 200 solar masses. So the, the kind of space which is there is pretty large and the number of templates is also large, something of the order of a million. So your <coughs> signal to the threshold turns out to be near 10 or something like 8, 9, 10 or something like that. So this is the kind of thing which happens. So this is now I've run through the whole thing, what, how you can do this kind of detection. Now I come to my last slide, concluding remarks. This is the basic schema, which I've described for the search of coalescing binaries, which was given very long time by us in 91 and 94 and so on. But the methods have improved over the years. Models are more complex. Black holes have spins. There could be, there could be precision of the black holes. So, the waveforms are more complicated. Then one has gone from the frequentist maximum likelihood to Bayesian techniques and things like that, which I have not described here. But the point is that basic structure, 
likelihood ratio, all these things are all here in this Bayesian. Whether you do Bayesian or not, you have to integrate the likelihood ratio instead of maximizing. That's all. And then you have the Bayesian statistic. For other types of sources, so now this is what this what I talked was for black hole binaries. There are other types of sources also, gravitational wave sources. There, there the techniques are different. So it's not match filtering. It can be time frequency methods for burst sources, cross correlation for uh, stochastic background, and so on. And uh, there the things are different. <clears throat> but I wanted to, in this talk, I wanted to address the question of match filtering because this was a method which was applied. For the current, uh, we have had detections for black holes and neutron stars. And these are the only detections we have had so far. And so I thought I will uh, restrict or focus my talk more on what has been detected so far. But there are, but there are other types of sources and they may be, they will be detected in the future. And one thing which I want to make stress here is that the mathematical and statistical techniques which are here are indispensable. And uh, one must apply search algorithms founded on statistics and mathematics. So very <clears throat> there are powerful techniques in statistics and mathematics. And that has to be uh, properly and correctly and exactly applied. Uh, and they have to be desired to be. And these have to be applied so that your algorithms become computationally efficient and optimal. So thank you. So I'll stop my talk here. So I can <clears throat> I can take questions. I'll have some drink of water. So <clears throat> any questions? Where I should give a chat box? So. What happened? Hello? Where? Did you send? Where is the chat? Yeah, nothing is appeared.
Ah, okay, something. Ah, okay. What is the time for which we received the what? Uh, what is the time for which you receive the gravitational wave from collision of black hole? Is it in minutes or seconds or something? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the answer to this is it depends on the masses of the black holes. <clears throat> so if the masses are large, then the <clears throat> am I being hurt? Okay. <clears throat> if the masses are large, then uh, what happens is that <clears throat> they coalesce quicker, and like for the 30 solar masses, the thing is like. 0.2 second or a fraction of a second for neutron star binaries, for example, <clears throat> that signal was something like 100 seconds, two minutes. So bigger the masses, the quicker they coalesce within the bandwidth of the detector. So it can range from uh, from for neutron stars from uh, seconds or minutes to fractions of a second. Of course, it also depends on the bandwidth of the detector. Right now, I think we are able to get to something like uh, 20 hertz or 30 hertz. So the lower the bandwidth, lower the uh, low, uh, what is the low part of the frequency, uh, lower the lower bandwidth, the frequency at the bottom end, the longer the signal. What, uh, how are signals distinguished from different families? Like black hole, so it's the same family. Whether it's black hole merger or neutron star, uh, neutron star, uh, neutron star in spiral it is called, or black hole in spiral. So basically it is the same family. So we search for neutron stars as well as black holes together. But there are some small differences in the neutron star and <clears throat> black holes. The neutron stars will coalesce generally quicker because of the fact that they, there is a tidal deformation and the tidal deformation drags energy, takes energy from the orbit. And so the orbital energy is lost <coughs> in the tidal deformation. So the neutron star will generally coalesce quicker. So in that way, one can distinguish a neutron star collision from a black hole collision. Of course, there are other ways also. So what? How much time, what? How to determine the frequency band of operation of LIGO because noises dominate at low frequencies as well as, yeah, so there is a band. So if it goes, so there is no fixed band as such, but there is a, almost a wall at low frequencies. It comes from the seismic noise. So it's like F to the minus 12 or something like that. So you can set the lower limit. The upper limit is again set by the photon short noise. So the photon short noise climbs up. And generally, if it goes from uh, the order of magnitude higher, you call that the bandwidth. So suppose that the lowest, the most sensitive part is at certain H0. If it becomes 10 H0 or 15 H0, you call that the double, <clears throat> you call that the, that's the point where you cut off. Because after that, you will anyway get a very little signal in the match filter. How much time it takes to extract gravitational wave signal from noise? Yeah, that depends on the computers you have. So uh, <clears throat> generally, I mean, they are supposed to uh, work very quickly. I mean, I mean, optimally, what you should have is online operations. Online, you should be able to actually extract the signal. So that that's a question which uh, I mean, with uh, the kind of things which you have with teraflops and kind of kind of speeds we have, we can do it very fast. We can almost do it online or within minutes. In fact, I think the first LIGO signal, first detection, one came to know within a, I think in few seconds or in a minute or so. I came to know about it in a, in a, in a few minutes. What operation of... Uh, Do computer simulations of gravitational wave uh, signals 
help in match filtering yeah that they can test your algorithms and so on so you can do computer simulations of gravitational wave signals and you can play games with that in order to see how well you can extract your signal from the noise what are the where you set the thresholds and things like that so they do help exactly why is the height of the peak of the signal in the fourier space t by 2 yeah that you have to do a calculation it's a i mean what is that i think it is spread like that i mean it's half half one is at the negative frequency one is at the positive frequency the two peaks so it is spread the energy is spread between the two why is the no so what what which softwares are used we make the software does the fourier transform of the autocorrelation function always lead to uh, psd yeah so if you have auto correlation function <clears throat> and the noise is more or less stationary then uh, you can do the fourier transform the point is that the noise is not so stationary so uh, one needs to actually do a lot of things uh, to actually look at to <clears throat> get the psd but usually it is uh, <clears throat> it is evaluated by taking the i mean sort of ergodic average that means you calculate the psd you take it various data segments then calculate the fourier transform calculate the psd and then you average over psd for <coughs> few segments and that you call the that's your psd in the match filtering graph how is the chirp different from the data plot that's the signal okay the data is the chirp plus the noise so your chirp is uh, actually i don't know whether i can you can see anything is it visible i don't know i'm not sure yeah so chirp is this this is embedded inside the noise so your data has got the chirp already inside it with a lower amplitude the amplitude has been reduced so you don't see the signal, the chirp at all what you see is just noise do the match filtering i don't know we are referring to here ha we do the match filtering you get a peak what no should we stop the signal i mean okay which other noises apart from gaussian noise are analyzed yeah okay okay that's the thing here the real detectors uh <coughs> have the i mean have, have don't have really gaussian noise <coughs> the noise there are too many non gaussian entities in the noise so the real data analysis is not exactly done like this we have to veto out all the non gaussianities and so on so once you veto out things and all that what remains looks somewhat like gaussian noise but not exactly <clears throat> so that procedure is somewhat different but what i have de described here is the ideal thing but this is where you start and you have to do match filtering and all these things in order to do the actual data processing 
to get thresholds and all that, one has to do different things. <clears throat> In fact, you need several detectors. Will the probability of detection increase simultaneously when we decrease the probability of false detection? No, no. In fact, if you decrease the problem, I mean, that is in your hands. The false alarm probability is in your hands because that threshold is what you set. So if you reduce the false alarm, uh, false alarm probability, your threshold will rise, in fact. And so your detection probability also will go down. Can the GW signal converted into an audio signal? No, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it is in the audio band as, it's, as, it, as it is there. Can the GW signal converted into audio signal? Can it tell us there are any component noises left in the filter data? Yeah, there are. <coughs> There was some, uh, uh, what do you call, thought about this, but uh, I don't know whether the GW signal is so strong enough to give an audio signal strong enough for our ear to distinguish the signal from the noise, because our ear can many times distinguish. Yeah, so there, are, so there were some efforts like that, but I don't think on the whole you can do this. You have to do match filtering and you have to go through the whole. Uh, statistics. Can the GW signal convert it? No, that is done. Thank you. No. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 